Believe it or not, I used to look like that. Uh, Scott Guyberson was actually appointed to, uh, by the Surgeon General of the United States to be the Chief Pharmacy Officer in March of uh, 2010. I got a call from someone at that point that says, guess who's the next Chief Pharmacy Officer? I said, who? And they said, Scott Guyberson. I said, you're kidding me. <laughs> that office is not big enough for that boy. <laughs> and I knew that there was a lot of people that were out there that were actually um, hoping that they'd get appointed for this. Some of the ones that had been in when I am, they, they were older and they said, but they got this young pup in there. I said, wow, their hands are gonna be full. I can read to you the, briefly the list. Uh, he joined IHS in, in 1994, Indian Health Service. He served as a clinical pharmacist at about three stations. He served as a chief pharmacist at one. He became a senior public health advisor to the program, along as a senior medical program officer, acting division director, uh, he was detailed to the Department of Defense to do global health. He became an HIV AIDS expert. Um, he was a, uh, I did, the list just goes on. I'm, I'm gonna stop with that, but I'm gonna go back to where I actually did know Scott. Now I'm gonna back up a little bit. Back in the 70s, the Indian Health Service ran out of physicians. The Vietnam War was over. It was an obligatory service for physicians at that time. And so they decided they would take some pharmacists and create a, a practitioner, a pharma, we called it the Indian Health Service Pharmacist Practitioner. I was one of the early ones to get into that program. And so they, they figured it was a lot easier to take pharmacists and teach them some differential diagnosis than it was to take someone to teach them uh, medicine. So uh, we were, there was 81 of us that were total, I think, no, I'm sorry, 77 of us trained totally over the years. The program ended in 1981. Um, when we did have enough physicians at the time. So then uh, I actually went on through several stations and, and became the director of what was called the Clinical Pharmacy Training Program. And that's where I met Scott. It was probably about 1994. And I can't tell you any stories, that the good stories about Scott, because he's got plenty about me. So we're not going to go into that route. But Scott came in there and he said to me, he says, you're a practitioner. He says, I want to do that. And I said, well, Scott, the program ended in 1981. He says, no, I want to do that. How do I do it? Well, we had just recently created a new program in New Mexico called a pharmacist clinician. And with that particular program, several of us IHS people were grandfathered into that if we were licensed in the state of New Mexico uh, as, as practitioners. And so I actually hold license number five for that, that program. And then I come to Tennessee and can't do anything, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> But the, uh, Scott went through the program. He uh, got licensed in New Mexico. He did the required training they had and became a, a clinician. And as a clinician, he, was, he works in a family medicine clinic uh, in, on the Navajo reservation and has kept that up throughout the years. But Scott has always been the kind of guy that says, I'm gonna do something. And I knew when he became in the, the chief pharmacist uh, he was going to do something with that office. And I can tell you that there's been many people before him that have done nothing. And so uh, the big thing that he did is he wrote a paper. And, and actually the Surgeon General gets a lot of credit for it. But actually Scott wrote this. And I will tell you that a couple of other people helped him write it. They've reminded me of that several times when I've introduced him. But uh, the paper's called Improving Patient and Health System Outcomes to Advanced Pharmacy Practice, a report to the U.S. Surgeon General. And Scott will tell you about that as we go through here. But it is my privilege to introduce to you the Chief Pharmacist of the United States, Admiral Scott Garberson. No dancing from me. No dancing, check, check, get that, all right. Just wanna make sure you heard that. So, Thank you very much. Uh, I want to first bring greetings from the Office of the Surgeon General and the 18th Surgeon General of these United States, Dr. Regina Benjamin. She is very aware of my travel all the time. I have to get approval from her to come to these kinds of venues. And she knew, knew I was coming to Tennessee, and she's from the Deep South. She's from uh, Louisiana, Alabama area, family health clinic, very rural area. So she's very proud when I get to come and talk about her report and promote pharmacy practice because she is a big supporter. And if most people you don't know that she was actually a pharmacy technician student 
when she very long, long ago before she was a physician. So she has a special place in her heart for pharmacy. I want to say thank you to Bettina Black. I want to say thank you to uh, Miss Sadler. Where's Miss Sadler? Judy Sadler. Where's Judy? Oh, anyway, she had a lot to do with getting me here. Uh, Jim Bundy as well. Really, the, I met Bettina at APHA. I was doing the, my talk. She wanted to have me here, and I'm not too sure how this went down because it's very difficult to get me to all these venues. We get a lot of invitations every month, and I'm sure it had something to do with Steve Foster, and I'm sure that he said, you want Guyberson, I'll get you Guyberson. I got a lot of dirt on him. <laughs> so there's one of two things that you can go both ways with this, a little positive or a little negative. So Steve Foster and I go way back, as he mentioned to you, and he does have some things on me that I don't want exposed. However, um, he was my first mentor my first clinical mentor. Now you know him through ACIP and Tennessee and the immunization program. I mean, think about what he has done nationally for immunizations. Incredible work. You should all be very proud of him and we're proud of him in the Indian Health Service because we cultivated this successful person, right? So he was a mentor to a lot of people and especially a mentor to me. So that's the first way you can go with that. The second way you can go with it is, now he was my mentor and now I'm retirement eligible so that makes him really old. <laughs> so I have about an hour. The adult attention span is what? 13 minutes, something like that, right? My attention span is about three. So I'll bore myself before I'll bore any of you guys. So I'll keep that in mind when I talk to you. Now I have students back here. Where's my students? Raise your hands high so I can see you. You guys need to be over there, unless you're different schools, like Civil War. Is that the thing going on here? So I'll be addressing, I'll be looking at you guys a lot today in this talk. I'll move myself around. I, I never stay behind the podium. But I'm going to move myself around. I'm going to look at you guys a lot because this message is for the future of pharmacy. All these people here are your mentors and they're going to be leading you, but they're really just paving the way. You have to make the difference. So this message, this transforming pharmacy, it's going to start with the Bettina Blacks and the Steve Fosters and decades ago, but we have to take this and move forward instead of just keep reinventing the wheel. So I will talk to you today about a few things, um, but I want to set the tone. And the tone is this, people who graduated pharmacy school 20, 30, 40 years ago, maybe even 50 years, how many people graduated pharmacy school over 40 years ago? Wow, that's incredible, congratulations, seriously. That's a wealth of knowledge for all of you. Take those people, I want you to go back however long when you started pharmacy school, and I want to see the person that was excited about pharmacy. I want to talk today for the next 45, 50 minutes to the person who knew that they had the world in the palm of their hands, opportunity at their fingertips. That's the person I want in this room. I don't want to talk to the naysayers or the ones that complicate things with all different reasons why we can't do something. We're going to do something by the end of this talk. We're going to commit to doing something. Now, I have a responsibility as well. My responsibility is to not let these guys down because they went through all this trouble to get me here. But it's also to have impact. This is the best part of my job. Believe me, working in Washington, it's not always kicks and giggles, you know? Traffic and politics and money and no money, right? We'll have a car wash out there to support the U.S. Public Health Service afterwards. <laughs> I sell pictures, $49.95 package. It's a special. I don't really do that. I'm just kidding. Anyway, so I want that person in that room today. I want to talk to you guys today, and I want to inspire you. I want to make you commit to something, and I'm going to charge you with some things, and I'm going to be challenging. I'm going to challenge the students. I'm going to challenge the faculty. I'm going to challenge the state board. I'm going to challenge the way you used to think about things to think just a little bit differently. Now, you all have a good start in Tennessee, because I know you're very progressive here, and I've spoken with Bettina, and I know Steve, so I know you're almost there, so let's keep it going. So, we're going to talk about the report, right? The pharmacy report to the Surgeon General was a, sort of a big hit, went viral, had a lot of good positive feedback about that. But the report's just a tool. It reflects the actions that all of you do. And we just reduced it to paper. And yes, it was based on my experiences, and yes, it was based on some of the previous, my predecessors, but you have to use that and do something with it. The other thing we'll talk about is the needs of the healthcare system. Always match the needs with your capacity and use evidence to prove it. We're going to facilitate partnerships today. So if you don't have the best relationship with, say, your medical association or maybe the state board and the Tennessee Pharmacy Association, whatever it may be, 
We're going to improve those partnerships. We're going to talk about a call to action. And I'll, like I said, I'll challenge you throughout this talk to make sure that we can set some identifiable and measurable actions after this. So what was my report, or uh, you know, what was the motive behind the report? The motive, people think, was to advance the profession. That really wasn't the motive. So in my other hat, my day-to-day -day hat is not the chief professional officer. That's my collateral duty. My other hat is I run the core. 6,600 healthcare professionals, 12 different disciplines, pharmacists, dentists, doctors, nurses, veterinarians, environmental health, engineers, all of them combined. That's my responsibility. And I get to see all the different categories and see their health professions and see who's utilized the most in the healthcare system and where's the gaps. And I can tell you from looking at all of them and comparing them to their private sector colleagues that by far pharmacists are the most underutilized healthcare professional in the United States. Given your level of education, given your training, given your practice environment, you're underutilized. So when I look at all those things, my, patient, my motive wasn't really for pharmacy in general. It was to improve patient care. So it was patients. It was health, the healthcare system. I have the benefit of wearing this uniform to say I could sort of think about politics secondary and I could think about what makes the most sense, what's evidence-based, what's logical, and move forward with that. So the goals were to improve patient and health system outcomes. And of course, you get an ancillary effect from that, and that's hopefully to improve the profession, move the profession forward and advance it. We have to have a mission. So as a chief professional officer, my mission was to advance the health of the nation, but advance the profession as well. I'm going to talk to the students now. I'm going to come down and make this a little bit more direct to the students. You have to start with some tenet, or tenets, plural, to say, I have a platform to build upon. And I'm telling you right now, forget what everybody else says. Forget what's not in the Social Security Act. Forget what you think you are trying to fight for. You are healthcare providers. When you graduate from pharmacy school, you will take care of patients and provide direct patient care. That means you are healthcare providers. You are also public health professionals. Last I checked, pharmacists did immunizations. Steve Foster. That's preventive health care. That's public health. Last I checked, we do disaster management. Last I checked, we're epidemiologists. We're in every pharmacy in every city across the country. We see health. We see the flu come on. We see different trends of health, maybe obesity trends or infectious disease trends. So we have that in our nature, and it's part of our practice. So we're public health professionals. Those two things, don't let anybody tell you differently. I don't care what's on paper. I don't care what's in the law or the regulation. That's who you are. And last, we have a common practice. It's our fault that we have a common practice and not common law. It's much like common law, though. Think about it in the legal aspects. Common law is not always in the books. It's a way decisions were made based on previous court cases. Well, on previous pharmacy cases and on previous pharmacy practice, we could show evidence that, yes, we are these healthcare providers, right? The physicians actually come to us and ask us for assistance in patient care. We do provide patient care. And it's not always the, the myth is, you know, they come to us where they hand us a stable, hypertensive patient. Everything's just fine, and they'll, they allow us to take care of a patient. We know that's not true. We get unstable conditions because... It's very difficult to manage patients with dyslipidemia, diabetes, and hypertension all at the same time, and that's the most of our patients. Obesity, metabolic syndrome, all those different things. I have a lot of visuals in my talk because I like visuals, and visuals lasting memory, right? Some of the things that, uh, some of the things that I'll, I'll talk about today you'll probably forget, and that's okay. If you remember some of the pictures, it'll paint the image that you need to remember some of the concepts and points. So, without dating anyone, anybody know what year this is? I heard 64, six, 1963 Volkswagen bus. It's a great picture. It has a lot of different meanings to it, okay? So, 1963, the Public Health Service, specifically Indian Health Service, said, we're gonna do clinical pharmacy. 30 years ago, not 1999, not 2002 Medicare Modernization Acts, not 2000, 
9, MTM, none of that stuff. 1963. And the VA came on board. And the Department of Defense and Federal Pharmacy. And some big organizations did clinical pharmacy. And funny, it said, box yourself in. I didn't put that there. That came with the picture. But I think very appropriate because that was exactly what we did not do. Did not box ourselves in. Said we are needed in clinical practice. So we need to take care of patients. Interesting. Interesting. 1963. So that brings to mind another picture. I have lots of pictures. Lots of animals too. I like animals. This image is going to be symbolic of return on investment. If you think about this mouse working its butt off inside the tank on the wheel, right? You see them all the time in a pet store. Where are they getting? Nowhere. You come back a year later, they're still on that wheel. Big thighs, big muscles, you know, but <laughs> that's it, right? Really good shape, in really good shape. So this Olympic mouse here is kind of like pharmacy because pharmacy since 1963 has been doing clinical pharmacy and direct patient care and last I checked we were trying to promote MTM. How many people here have been practicing for 40 years doing MTM? You're doing a lot more than that too, right? Challenging the students, challenging the faculty. You'll hear it throughout the talk. Nothing wrong with MTM. That's just a piece of what we do. And we've reduced it to an acronym. Bad on us. So think about 30 years of practice, starting with clinical pharmacy in 1963. Think about the amount of training we have that keeps going up. Think about the privileges we have, which pretty much remain the same. And I'll challenge to say that we have not gotten the return on investment that we need. And that's nobody else's fault. It's our own fault as a profession. So the pharmacy report has a few main themes. First theme is that we're integrated as healthcare professionals. So no matter when I meet with physicians or if I meet with the American Medical Association or if I meet with whomever I meet with, I say we're already there. We're already integrated in many health systems depending on what you look at and what practice you have. We provide patient care. And if you look at definitions, find the American Academy of Family Physicians definition of primary care. Find the Institutes of Medicine definition of primary care. Primary care now. With the exception of diagnosis, we provide all the services of primary care. So does that mean we're not primary care providers? Well, let me ask you this. After a physician diagnoses a patient with diabetes type 2, how many times do they re-diagnose that patient with type 2 diabetes? But yet they're still primary care providers because they do, in fact, provide primary care. They reassess. They provide follow-up care, continuity of care. They're the patient's main point of contact. Well, we do that as well. You've all done it. So using their own definitions, we satisfy the requirements for being a primary care provider. Recognition as healthcare providers is the next step. So the second and third point, you have to put it in a report because it's our, it's our barrier. Our barrier is our recognition and compensation. It's not that we want a pat on the back. It's that we know that our services are needed by patients. Our services are needed by the health system. And if you take the politics out of it, it is the only evidence-based model that has not been implemented to help the healthcare system out yet. It's innovative. It's already there. It's been in existence for 30 years, and we're not using it. Why? Lots of reasons why. One of them, two of them are right here. Recognition. So we educate very well. Last I checked, we're the second most educated healthcare professional in the United States. There's physicians. Who comes after that? Us, right? And nurse practitioners and PAs are great. Dentists, great. They all do their thing. And they all have great privileges. We somehow continue to add on to our education and get no ROI. So the efficiency exists. Believe in yourselves that you can do this. We're a testament to that. I came out with a bachelor's degree, five years of pharmacy school. Well, three, three years of professional school, actually, because I came with a degree before that. And we practiced in the right environment, and we were just as clinical as any other healthcare provider, because that's about how long they went to school, too. No different. 
I don't know how health reform is going to evolve. Matter of fact, I'm not even allowed to talk about health reform because I don't, I'm not in the high echelons of health leadership in the department. However, I can tell you this, I don't care how it evolves. If you're not on the roster, you're not going to play in the game. Pharmacists are often like the water boy. I hate to say that, but we are. We're in the dugout and we're just right there and we talk to all the players and we give them water. We don't get to get out in the field. We don't get to get paid for our job. We don't get to do the services that they get to do, the privileges. We have to be on that roster to play in the game. And I don't care how health reform revolves. Somebody actually came up and said to me, well, it's going to be team-based care, so it really doesn't matter you know, if we're not named as health care providers in the Social Security Act. That's what we think. But when it comes down to legal issues, when it comes down to compensation, when it comes down to all the other alibis as to why we can't provide patient care, it's because it, we're not on the roster. So get on that roster. Make that a primary goal. And I know all the states have sort of rallied around this cause to be named a health care provider. You need to be on that. So you don't give anybody else the ability to use that as an alibi and say, well, you're not even a health care provider. Clinical psychologists, dietitians, clinical social workers, health care providers in the Social Security Act. It's OK. They're great providers, but so are we. If you think we don't provide direct patient care and they do more of it than we do, then there's something wrong with our profession. Legislative history. We've done a wonderful job being as detailed as we are. That was a politically correct way of saying we're anal. <laughs> as detailed as we are, we've done a wonderful job of confusing the heck out of all the politicians. We've put all kinds of terms in there. We, we come up with all kinds of acronyms. and We put such detail in the bills that go to Congress that they get confused about what the heck we do in the first place. So we have to simplify the way we do things. Stick to one thing. We're going to be called health care providers. Here's why. That's it. We've had different states put in different bills. They put diagnosis on the bill. Pharmacists are allowed to do diagnosis. Everything was okay with the bill until you stuck that word in there. Right? That's a red flag. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about independent prescribing authority. That comes with privileges. That comes at the local level. I could have a license in a PA. I'm not going to practice in a facility unless I get privileges at that facility. So it doesn't matter that the fact that my licensure says my state scope practice should be broad. So our legislative history has confused some people at Congress, and we're not doing ourselves justice by continually confusing and changing and adding different things here and there and different states propose different things. I'm a New Mexico clinician. New Mexico put in a bill and everything was fine except they used the model only from their state. And it confused the legislators and said, wait a minute, so you need a, a second license to do the job you're doing now as a pharmacist? Now it did get some return on investment in New Mexico. We got to be Medicaid providers, which is great, we get compensated. If I thought that would work across all the states, I'd say go ahead and do that, that's fine. But I'm not sure it will. And we really don't need that, we do that scope anyways through collaborative practice agreements. Compensation, I sort of mentioned that already, we don't know how reform's gonna evolve. Is it gonna be paid for performance? Is it gonna be fee for service? Is it gonna be a team-based capitated payment? I don't know. But you can't do services for free. And we have to separate it from the product. Here's another little problem with MTM, indirectly, you're tying yourselves right back to the product again. Medication therapy management. It is a service we provide, but it ties you right back to the product. It even says it in the name. You provide patient care. Finally, evidence-based outcomes. So the report includes evidence-based outcomes, tons of them. We've had outcomes for 30 years, 40 years. It's a positive thing that we have outcomes. We reduced it to paper, we consolidated all the evidence, and we said, here you go. And you know what? To this day, that, provide, that paper, that report provides a tool and an advocacy piece that nothing else is against. There's no other document out there that says, this pharmacy paradigm of care, where pharmacists provide health care and primary care to patients, doesn't work. There's nothing out there that says it doesn't work. So why can't we lobby this? The government, us, we ask for a cost-effective healthcare delivery model that utilizes the things that we already have in place so it doesn't cost much money, that utilizes our health professionals to the maximum of their licensure and education. It's right in front of them. We already have it, already done. And we have the evidence to prove it, and there's no evidence against it. And we can't get that done. Now, I can't lobby on the Hill. It's illegal. 
because I wear the uniform. You all can do the work because you're doing it anyway. Just keep doing it. Use these tools. Use this consistent message when you go to talk to your legislators and congressmen. We'll make a difference. So whenever you write a report, whenever you publish, my mentors always taught me this, ask the question, so what? So I wrote a report, big deal. Right? So I did another study on INRs. What difference does it make? Here's the difference that we think the report has made so far. It moves us past the habit of trying to prove that this model works. The model works. We've got plenty of evidence that says the model works. We don't really need another study that says, hey, you know what? If you allow the pharmacist to monitor Coumadin, then I bet you we'll keep the INR in good range a longer period of time. We could have the 57th study that says that. We know it works. We know we're good at it. So I'll challenge the students, if you want to do some research, use a business model. Find a business model to approach with your staff. Find administrative outcomes. What saves the doctor the most time? What shifts the doctor's workload to see more critical patients? Don't tell me that you can manage Coumadin and do INRs. I know that. We all know that. And that's good stuff because you need to do that. That's performance. Measure your performance when you're doing it. But we don't need another study to prove that we can do this. Take another step forward, work with a physician, do the research with a physician, and put it together. This report has gotten pretty far because it has physician support. Because I think Steve and I were saying the same things before I was Assistant Surgeon General and nobody wanted to listen to me. But now because I collaborated with a physician and got the most important physician in the United States to support it, it's a very important document now. So I'm not patting myself on the back, I'll pat our Surgeon General on the back for supporting it, for stepping outside the box. Former AMA chair member, or board member. We have data, we have quantitative data, qualitative data, because we told the story. We didn't just tell how important it was as far as clinical outcomes and impact. We talked about the relationship between physicians and pharmacists over the decades of practice. Because you know what, that's evidence itself. Because if physicians wanted to stop this model, they would have stopped it a long time ago if it wasn't working. So that's evidence. So the sustainability is an evidence itself. Umbrella approach. If you talk to me in private, you'll see that I don't like acronyms. I don't like siloing our services and describing exactly what we do to the nth detail. Do nurse practitioners do that? Do doctors do that? Do PAs do that? Do they say, we provide DD, differential diagnosis? No, they use the medical model. They get paid for a service. They see a patient. They document what they did. They get paid for that level of service they provide. That's all we ask. You get paid for the level of service you provide. If you don't provide the service, you don't get paid that much. If you do, you get the level of payment you deserve. So I say patient delivered services, patient care services, primary care services. I see it in your resolution you wrote. Pharmacist delivered patient care. That's basically what all the other providers do. It's following the medical model, but we have to put something in writing because we have to help people understand what we do. It's a tool, as I mentioned. This, this report has gone viral, which is great, and, and people are using it as a tool in grassroots efforts, and that's what it was intended to be. And finally, it has physician support, and I mentioned that. So we did a survey within the report, and then we got some support through letters outside of the report to support it as we move forward. But we did a survey, 118 physicians, first time this has ever been done in the, in the Indian Health Service or VA or anywhere that I know of. And we polled the physicians that actually worked with a pharmacist in this practice. So if I asked Steve, I said, Steve, you like to play cricket? Isn't cricket a great game? Well, his opinion on if he likes to play cricket is based on if he's ever played before, and he probably hasn't. So I could take that for what it's worth. So we always tend to get opinions from everybody that they've nearly never worked with a pharmacist in this capacity. So we decided to poll only physicians and only physicians that actually have worked with pharmacists in this capacity. So yes, it's a biased cohort, but it's necessarily biased because I want those opinions. And how do you think the opinions came out? If you saw these numbers for any other research data, you would think it was unanimous. It was astounding. 88%, 77%, 82%, 75%. They answered these questions or put them in the comments section of their survey. It was respondent-driven survey, voluntary, random selection. Allows a shift in workload for physicians. It doesn't say they stole my last patient. Right? 
There's plenty of patients out there, guys. I go to Gallup every year. There's a waiting list of 450 people in family medicine. They get no care or they get my care. I'll take my chances with my care. I've never met a physician that says, I just don't have enough patients. I just don't have enough work to do. We're not fighting for the same patients, guys. We're helping improve the patient care, improving the health system, improving access to care. And you can see some of those things. So overall, we had a 96% of the providers who responded reported overall benefit. Take that to your legislators and congressmen. These are physicians speaking, not pharmacists. So we have one of the most important physicians in the United States, Dr. Regina Benjamin, our admiral and U.S. Surgeon General. And she said two main things. She said, yes, you know what? This provides me enough evidence to say I, I think that this model works. I support this model where pharmacists collaborate with physicians and you guys are allowed to expand your scope. And two, I know your health care providers. Actually, her argument to me was even a step further than that. She said, you're actually experts, not just health care providers. Because, you know, you could say that a physician is, an, is a health care provider and has expertise in critical care, differential diagnosis, initial diagnosis, similarly with a nurse practitioner, PA. But we're, we're experts in chronic disease, in managing medications to help move the disease along, reduce complications, prevent further disease. And we didn't just get her involved. We got other people involved that not, were outside of the federal service. Right underneath her is Dr. Mark Lofman. How many people here have heard of the HRSA's PSPC program? It's a big private public sector collaboration where pharmacists and physicians work together in the private sector with the federal government folks and, and they do disease management. And there's 270 some sites across the country and it's working and he's a physician. He's a professor at Northwestern University. So he's an academician that sees the value. He wrote a three page letter on his own to support the report. And there's other people here, the top female in um, in the middle there, she's American Indian. She's the chief medical officer of the Indian Health Service. Right below her in uniform is the chief medical officer of the Bureau of Prisons, both physicians. These are two huge health systems in the United States. There's the VA, there's the Indian Health Service, Bureau of Prisons, three big health systems. They all utilize pharmacists in these roles, and we all know that. It must be working. And the other two are private sector physicians. Top right, Hershey Bell. Dean of a pharmacy school, physician. I spent some time up in Lake Erie College of Medicine, did their commencement speech this year. And he was just so excited about the report and so excited about the fact that he knows how valuable pharmacists are. So those people are out there. So I'll challenge you to meet a physician that supports it and get them to write an article with you. Don't write it on your own and put it in a pharmacy magazine. Write it with a physician and put it in a medical magazine or publication. So, the age-old battle of turf. Turf. Don't precipitate the turf problem. There's always going to be some turf issues. Always. Do you think nurse practitioners went through unscathed as they approached the AMA and they said, we want prescribing rights or we want to be able to see patients? No. There's 20% of the people, you'll never change their opinion. Ever. There's 20% that are already on board. I want to work on that middle 60. You take that middle 60% and you start to convert them, we've got a home run. Work on those people. Don't precipitate the, just assume that there's going to be some turf issues and that's okay. We can't be perfect. Pharmacists like to be perfect. Don't worry about it. Move forward. And the second thing, of course, is the almighty dollar. And the almighty dollar does make a difference. But you can show through administrative outcomes that you can actually generate revenue for a facility whether it be a health system, a clinic, a doctor's office, maybe a collaboration of physicians. In certain states where we actually bill for Medicaid, and there's a few of them, pharmacists can generate revenue for the health system. For, and they may not be getting it. It may not be like an independent pharmacist doing it, but a, a, a salaried pharmacist working to get, generate revenue. And you could even show the cost effectiveness upon return on investment for clinical outcomes. And I'll talk about that in just a bit. So, Remember, as we go through this, I'm going to talk about the big needs of the healthcare system. Need, capacity, through data. Okay, so here's the needs. I think chronic disease is a big problem in this country. I think you all know that. Leading cause of death and disability. 45% of the U.S. population has a chronic disease. Soon will be 50% of the population. 
and probably more on undiagnosed than that. As the people enter medical care with eligibility for insurances, you're not going to see the healthy and wealthy. You're going to see the poor and underserved and unhealthy. And that chronic disease rate is going to go up even higher. And the baby boomers are getting older. And you're going to see more patients. 76% of all physician visits are chronic care. 76%. Access. So as we make people eligible for health insurance, have we secured the solution to access to care? I might, and I'm being videoed, so I can't say much about the government right now. However, <laughs> I can tell you that we don't have a solution necessarily for access to care either. You're part of the solution. If you provide chronic disease management or manage the patient's medications, you're going to help with access to care. There's no doubt. And finally, the provider shortage. And there's really far and few between providers that will actually disagree with the fact that they know that there's going to be a provider shortage. So you've got three huge issues and demands on the healthcare system. Each one of them, you actually have a place to answer. So let's think about what's our capacity. So there's the need. Here's our capacity. Once again, I love images how powerful these images are. And you can see chronic disease is not just the elderly, it's the youth, it's the asthmatics, it's the middle-aged, it's the young adults. Many, many, many people have chronic disease and we have to protect that. I said 76% of all physician visits are chronic disease. Of all physician visits, of all healthcare, 80% use medications as their treatment modality. So there's surgery, and there's PT, and there's probably some holistic care, some behavioral health issues. But for the most part, 80% of the country uses medications for their treatment. I'll come back to that point. Second big thing we have in capacity. If a health system or a hospital or a, a chain or some other entity has cost problems, cost containment problems, who do they come to? Hospitals, pharmacy, right? They come to the hospital pharmacy, they come to the ambulatory care pharmacy, drug stores, community stores, independence, cost containment. We're supposed to be the experts on cost containment because drugs cost a lot of money. And if we improve their care through MTM and if we improve their medication management piece of it, we can reduce costs. And we have shown over the last 30 years that for every dollar put into the system, we'll give you four back. 30 years of evidence, one dollar in, four dollars back. That's cost effectiveness. So that's the second big thing you have. And then speaking about access to care, and here's my plug for community pharmacy and for independent pharmacy too, because I think there's a huge place for independent pharmacy in the future. If we can get that little piece about compensation worked out. Accessibility. Name one medical professional that's everywhere, full access to the community. Every street corner, every county, every city, every place in the U.S., there's a pharmacist and a pharmacy. I'm going to tell you one statistic. 270 million people visit a pharmacy each month. 270 million people. Oh, wait a minute. It wasn't each month. It's each week. 270 million people each week in a pharmacy somewhere in the United States. Wow. So you all are the second most trained healthcare professional. You all are supposed to be specialists in medications, in managing chronic disease, which is a burden, with medications. 80% of treatment nationwide is through medications, and you're everywhere. You tell me that you're not underutilized. Change that. It's ridiculous that we're not more utilized in the healthcare system. You have to convince people. Even if every one of you in here convinced one, pe one person, whether it be a legislator, a physician, or a pharmacy colleague that doesn't believe this, you convince them of this. And it doesn't matter if you're Uber pharmacist clinically in Indian Health Service or community pharmacy in Panama City. You each have a piece of this solution, a huge piece of it. Ah, healthcare equation, right? Academia loves the equation. How many academicians do we have in here? Lots, right? Tennessee Pharmacy Association. Uh, UT, we've got South, we've got, what else do we have here? What other pharmacy schools? Belmont. 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 Let's, let's, lots of them. 
So we have active emissions. So, okay, this equation will go. Anybody know what this equation is? It's a real equation. I gave you a coin. I had a coin with my name on it. Isn't that cool? They put it especially for me. And it's sort of, if you're, not a, if you're not a flag officer or an admiral or something, you're not supposed to put your name on a coin. So when you do get to this, you're allowed to put a name on a coin. So they tell me to work 15 hours a day, seven days a week, and I get a coin. It's not worth anything. Sell it on eBay, or you might have to pay somebody to take it from you. Anybody? So this is actually an equation I used in HIV when I was doing HIV. It's, it's called the effective contact rate. They use it for reproduction. Sometimes they use it in virology to talk about infectivity of, of different infectious diseases like HIV or malaria. However, it's the number of contacts per unit of time times the probability of infection. So when I saw this, they said, well, gee, number of contacts per unit of time, I could, I could relate this. Suppose I wanted to improve health across the country. I wanted to have the effective health contact rate. Who would I use? What prof profession would I use? So if I think 270 million visits per week, that satisfies my contacts per unit of time. And my probability of infection, the way I analyzed that was I said, well, what's the probability of us having an impact on that person's health? What's my scope of practice? What's my training level? Am I capable of doing it? Well, when I look at all those variables, I think my effective health impact rate, and I just make this up, this is not an official equation, is the accessibility times the scope and the training. What's the rate limiting step there? It's not the accessibility. It's not the training. It's the scope. We need some privileges to do some things. We need the ability through collaborative practice agreement to take care of patients like we know we can, like we should be able to. So we're getting towards the end now, and I have a couple more pictures. So the deputy surgeon, so there's the surgeon general, there's the deputy surgeon general, they're both physicians, and then there's little old me, assistant surgeon general, right, fighting against the physicians. Actually, we have a great relationship, but we do have a little bit of a competitive relationship. I just heard a little bit of a talk this morning from uh, Joan, is it? Joan from uh, Tennessee, University of Tennessee, women's uh, athletic director, chancellor, very important person with a lot of experience, and she said it's good to be competitive. That little competitive spirit gives you an edge sometimes. And she's a highly successful person. So the Deputy Surgeon General, I have a little competition about speaking engagements, right? So we go around and talk. We do a lot of talks, a lot of keynotes. And, you know, he's better than me as a speaker, but I'm the up-and-comer. And everybody around the office is starting a little buzz about, hey, Guyerson, he might be as good as you, Admiral Lushniak. And no, no, he's not as good as me. Well, we went to APHA, and we actually shared the stage. My home field, APHA, right? We did a talk. I dropped some great quotes. Did a good talk. I was on. I was excited. I was passionate. And he did his talk, and he was great. And APHA, no offense to APHA, but they, you know, summarized the whole event afterwards, and they talked about the keynote. And they said, Admiral Lushniak said this quote. He says, we fight for health, not against disease. Profound quote, right? He nailed it. And during my talk, I did this analogy in about thinking outside the box, thinking outside the bucket. So they put in the report, they said, and Admiral Guyberson said, stay out of the bucket. <laughs> I called up Tom Menigan at APHE. I said, you're killing me. You're killing me. And Admiral Lushni, I came up and said, hey, nice quote. It's good. It's a good job, youngster. So this is a, a rat in a bucket, OK? Now, if you fill up the bucket with water, that rat swims around for about 15 minutes and dies. You take that same rat, put him outside for a while, put him back in the bucket, fill it up again, he swims around for an hour because he sees what it's all about outside the bucket. He wants to get back out of there, and he'll swim hard to get back outside that bucket. Well, I make the analogy of pharmacy, and I say pharm the pharmacists are the Michael Phelps of swimming in the bucket. We love it in there. We love the training in there for the Olympics, right? I mean, you can't beat us in there. Put any other healthcare provider in that bucket, we'll kick their ass. <laughs> but is that a good thing? Is that a good thing? No, it's not a good thing. You have to see what it's like outside that bucket. And we have little glimpses of it, little glimpses of it. Indian Health Service, VA, some great programs like Kaiser and Blue Cross, some of these programs that support us. And we're outside that bucket. We're in our wonderland. Alice in Wonderland, right? We're in Wonderland. And we jump back in the bucket. 
And we do that to ourselves. 30 years since 1963, 40 years, 50 years, whatever, 50 years. And we're still talking about MTM and things like that as, as progressive and innovative. It's not, it's not, folks. It's good stuff, but it's been around a long time. So stop the inside the bucket thinking. How do we think inside the bucket? Let me give you an example. I went up to physicians, and I don't know if you can see this in black, this little thing on the diagonal here. It says post-diagnosis. So I'm talking about a patient that's already been diagnosed. Now we know when they go back to their primary care physician, nurse practitioner, PA, they're still getting a primary care visit because they're doing other services. They're doing some of these services, right? You collect data, you assess the patient, subjective data, right? Taking their meds and social behavior, family history, all those kinds of things. It's good. You guys do that? How many people have done that, right? Yeah, raise your hands, come on. All right, good. How about counseling? Y'all counsel, public health, immunizations? Keep the hands up, come on. All right, stay right there with me. Adherence, talk about adherence. Do some med reconciliation, all that stuff, right? Manage medications, develop therapeutic plans. How about some assessments? Some of you do blood pressures, physical assessment, look in their eyes, maybe they're, you know. And we can look at labs. Do we interpret laboratories? Yeah, if I see a cholesterol of 270, do I notice it? Yep, say something's wrong. And how about prescriptive authorities? Some of us have prescriptive authorities too. Maybe limited, but we do, right? prescriptive authorities, and maybe we make an appointment to follow up with that patient, or maybe we say, hey, this is a diabetic who hasn't had an eye exam or a chest x-ray in five years. Let's refer them back and get something done. It's a referral. Continuity of care, follow-up care, all these things. Ask a physician what that is. It's a chronic care visit, right? Chronic care. We in pharmacy tend to see it differently. So these are all the acronyms of the services we provide. And we've identified this on our own, okay, and we've put it out there. These are all acronyms for the same service. And you'll find, and this is where I get, you know, people start throwing oranges and apples and tomatoes at me. These acronyms are passionately backed by some people. That's okay. There are certain services that we all provide. It's a common denominator. Every pharmacist everywhere can provide these services. That's great. Medication therapy management, see if I can get these right. Comprehensive team-based medication therapy management. Comprehensive drug therapy management, medication management, comprehensive medication management, and comprehensive medication therapy management. And you'll see these everywhere, and you'll see them tried to argue it differently, like CMM is not MTM, don't call it the same thing. <laughs> so me, looking at it from a 30,000, 40,000 foot level, it seems a little odd, doesn't it? that we identify and silo our services so tightly that it confuses people. If a nurse practitioner graduated out of school and they say, what do you do? They, she, she says, I do DD, differential diagnosis. People would think that's odd because we know they're trained to be a provider. They just do provider stuff, right? If we're healthcare providers, that's one of the services we provide. That is not all the services we provide. This are all the services. These are all the services we provide. Don't put yourselves in that circle, in that bucket. Use the big one. No other healthcare provider would do that to themselves except pharmacy. I encourage you to think differently about this. Think the big circle. You're all doing that for free, pretty much. Or you're getting $10 or So what have we done so far with this report? Trying to collate some of the data, and I'm almost done. CMS regulation, you know that the Part A amendment, CMS for the first time, listed pharmacists right next to PAs and nurse practitioners as healthcare providers, if so chosen by the local authorities. So basically what they're saying is the medical model. If locally they need you to improve access, or if locally they need you to function as a healthcare provider, it's okay. That seems like privileges to me. Right? You come with the licensure and the credentials and the training, and locally they privilege you if needed. That's what it is. Well, CMS, and I work with CMS all the time, what I'm trying to get them to see is that you can't have us as providers in one part and not as providers in another part. We need to be, we either are or aren't providers, and we do provide patient care in many settings. The National Health Service Corps, for the first time ever, were listed as an eligible primary care provider for state loan health repayment. First time ever. And they've used the report as a tool. I wasn't there, had nothing to do with it. 
organizations, APHA, start to see little tweaks in the missions. Instead of talking about medication outcome, they talk about patient outcome, because that's your goal, patient outcome. You start to see little tweaks in, in missions and visions and academia changing how they teach just a little bit. All those little tweaks may not matter right now, but they're going to matter for your generation. People who are going to be pharmacists two years from now, three years from now, next year. And we've seen some great collaborations. I got back last week from Georgia. I won't say it too loud. It's my SEC tour. However, Georgia said, you know what? I was talking right in front of the Georgia State Medical Association and the Georgia State Pharmacy Association sitting right by, side by side. And I saw them afterwards shaking hands and saying, we're going to do this together. And there was a collaboration. I don't know if I stimulated it or not, doesn't matter, but the fact is that they're going to do something. They promise to do something with each other collaboratively. That's great. If we do that in every state, the practice will drive the scope, which will drive the law. I talked about many of these things. We're, you know, we try to get to do as many speaking engagements as possible. We'll get to go overseas and talk a little bit about it in many states. So let's talk about transformative thinking. And this is what I want to leave you with here. We seek improved patient outcomes. Tell me what a medication outcome is. Students, tell me what a medication outcome is. It's hard to do because it's really a patient outcome or a clinical outcome, not a medication outcome. Medication outcome ties you to the product. Therapeutic outcome, maybe a blood level, right? Oh my, you know, INR is this because of the adjustments I made in the anticoagulation therapy. But really, it's the disease state you're trying to improve, the patient care you're trying to improve. This is a big one. We're healthcare providers that manage disease with our expertise in medication use. Yes, you manage disease, but do you just, or yes, you manage the meds, but do you just manage, can you manage the meds without the patient? You gotta manage the patient, the disease, with your expertise in medications. It's like a nurse practitioner managing a patient with their expertise in care, patient care and differential diagnosis or chronic disease management. That's what you all do as well. And you have the most training in that. Prepare students for patient care. I don't care what pathway you take when you graduate pharmacy school. Go to independent pharmacy, go to ambulatory care, go to industry, it doesn't matter. When you come out, you should be prepared to be a provider of patient care. Then you choose the pathway you want. Keep all the doors open. I never want to close any. We shouldn't be our own harshest clinic, harshest critic. Clinic, see, I'm thinking clinical. Right? Pharmacists are generally speaking our harshest critics. We're a big, big profession, a very dichotomous profession. The business side, the clinical side, the patient care side, very hard, but like I said, don't shut the door on anybody. We need everybody. We need the community pharmacy. It's accessibility. It's our strength and number. So we have the evidence. I talked about that. Don't polarize the professions. We collaborate. We don't seek independent authority. We seek some autonomy in what we do, some cognitive decision making, because we take care of patients. But we don't seek independence. We're one of those professions that's willing to be collaborative. Sometimes too much so. We hurt ourselves by wanting to be so collaborative and then somebody says no and we're like, oh, okay. And don't limit the wonderful minds. And students can clap because you guys are wonderful minds. If Steve Foster limited my wonderful mind 20 years ago, I wouldn't be here today. But not only did he not limit my wonderful mind, he kicked me in the butt and said, go, do it. Do what you want to do. I know you can do it. So I'm telling you, you can do it. Call to action, partner, right now, today, make a commitment to do one thing. If everybody in here did one thing in the next year or two, we'd have a huge difference across the United States. Make one partnership. That's just an example. Change one thing in the State Collaborative Practice Act. Change one thing in legislation. Change one thing in a local relationship with a physician. Have them support something. Reduce it to paper, document, move forward. So leverage your new tools, collaborate. I talked about all these things, you know. We have enough time in education. We have the innovative models. Stay broad, don't get microscopic with your views. Think outside the box. So when we think about our relationship with the physicians, we always have to set a goal. What's our goal? 
Is the physician the zebra? I don't know. Are we the lion pouncing on the prey? Is it predatorial relationship we have with physicians? Maybe some of them think so. I'm taking my patients. We're not taking our patients, and they know that. And I've never worked with a physician, like I said, that have mentioned that, so that's just a joke. Don't go back and say, Scott says we're preying on you, and we're going to take all your patients, and you don't like us. So we're not at this stage right now. We're well beyond that. Let's see what we got next here. Parasitism. Are we parasites leached on the back of the physician? They're just crawling along just fine, and we're sucking the blood out of them. Sucking the life out of them. Annoying, pain in the butt. Right? No, we're not that either. So now we're getting a little closer, okay? And this is a philosophy that's thrown out with turf issues, okay? So we'll say the physician's the nice squirrel here, tries just trying to eat a nut. And we're the little birds. Annoying. It doesn't really affect the squirrel too much, but it's just annoying, you know? We're beyond that too, I think. And there's some philosophies that span this get spectrum. Ah, we're getting a little closer now. This is commensalism. It's a type of symbiotic relationship. It doesn't benefit both partners, but it benefits one. Okay, so the egret gets food, eats the flies. The water buffalo, eh, you know, they might stir up some flies. They're really unaffected one way or the other. We're probably there in a lot of respects because we do a lot of good for the patients. Sometimes the health system doesn't realize it, but we do a lot of good for the patients. Sometimes third-party payers like Blue Cross and Blue Shield realize the benefit. Sometimes third-party payers don't know. It's not because they're against it. They're just ignorant of it, and I mean that in a good way. Where do we want to be? Everybody's relationship from the movie Finding Nemo, the clownfish and the sea anemone, pure mutualism, beneficial to both parties, both entities. That's where we want to be. Who benefits the most? Not either one of us, the patient, the ocean, the ocean of patients. So I like these analogies as I go through. So 2012, I'm telling you right now, make a commitment. Make one thing different. Right? We're in this wonderland. We've got the chance. We're outside the bucket now. Some of the report brought us outside the bucket. Some of our pioneers before us, like Steve Foster's and Bettina Black's and all these other people I met yesterday, have put us outside the bucket. Students, stay outside the bucket. Don't let the professors teach you the wrong way. Challenge them. Say, wait, 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 this doesn't make any sense. Why do I have to go through five, six years of pharmacy school, then do a residency, then go out, then tell somebody I don't really know how to do MTM? You better know how to do MTM when you come out of school. I'll challenge Steve. He knows how to do it. He's been doing it for 50 years, maybe 70. Who knows? <laughs> right? When we bring out the IHS scribes and their Steve Foster signature, you know, etched in stone. <laughs> so in 2000, so you can't do anything to me while I'm up here. Right? 2012, make a difference this year. I'm going to leave you with one thing. And I know you didn't see this at APHA because I didn't have it at APHA. How many people here have seen the movie The Matrix? The young students are like, who's The Matrix? It's a movie. So Morpheus was living outside The Matrix. He was living outside the box. He was living in that wonderland. And he gave you a choice. And how appropriate, two medications. You take the blue pill. Tomorrow, you wake up, same old. Do the same thing. You go in the same practice pharmacy. You don't make a change. You take the red pill, and you stay in Wonderland. And I'll show you just how deep the rabbit hole goes. Thank you. <laughs>